Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. It is my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020. This bill brings together the results of three years of extensive public consultation by the Morrison government with stakeholders right across Australia's vast media landscape. This bill, these laws were drafted closely with the Australian Cons Competition and Consumer Commission, which found that government intervention is required to correct the enormous imbalance of bargaining power between digital platforms and local news businesses. The code represents a world first. This is a global first in tackling the glaring issue of the decline of traditional advertising revenues, where traditional media organisations in this country are being subjected to what we can only say, and we've seen this obviously in recent days from Facebook, uh, nothing more than abuses of market power. It has been a dramatic change in our media landscape. But fundamentally, Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill is about ensuring that journalists are properly remunerated for the content they generate and, of course, which the global technology platforms so benefit from. And I understand firsthand the, the sweat and the blood and the tears that goes into producing quality journalism. I worked over some 16 years for a number of media organisations, including Channel 7, 9, 10 and the ABC. Uh, in various roles in news and current affairs, also made a few documentaries. And I well understand the hard yakka it takes to produce one one-minute news story. It involves a lot of resources, a lot of people, uh, camera, camera operators, journalism, editors, producers, uh, and of course all of the technical requirements to actually broadcast. Th things have changed a lot, of course. It is now a lot easier to broadcast live uh, than it was uh, in the, uh, as I say, the old days. But there has been a dramatic change in our media landscape, where the margins of our traditional media companies are being squeezed by the big global players, and this code is all about providing a level playing field. A strong democracy requires a free, diverse and sustainable domestic news media sector. And this bill will support Australian publishers and broadcasters, big, medium and small, through a number of crucial measures. These include measures to encourage parties to undertake commercial negotiations outside of the code support smaller news media businesses with efficient pathways to finalising agreements with platforms by enabling them to publish standard offers. Uh, another measure included is to establish a negotiation framework under the code which allows parties to bargain in good faith and reach binding agreements. And in contrast to what we have seen, the appalling behaviour we have seen from Facebook in recent days, I do want to commend the conduct of Google, which has entered into a number of very significant deals with media companies in this country, including News Corporation Australia, the Nine Network and the Seven Network. And I hope and trust that there will be more deals to follow, uh, including for smaller regional players, which are also vitally important in holding us as a government to account in our democracy uh, and, of course, in ensuring that public interest journalism in Australia is alive and well. There are other measures in the bill which set 
clear and workable minimum standards for digital platforms, including requiring 14 days advance notice of deliberate algorithm changes which impact news media businesses, uh, and a measure which ensures that an independent arbiter is able to determine the level of remuneration that should be paid under a fair and balanced final offer arbitration model should the parties be unable to reach agreement. So in this country, we legislate for Australians and for the benefit of Australian companies. This is landmark legislation. I pay credit to the Prime Minister, to the Treasurer, to the Communications Minister who have led the charge on this very, very significant legislation. The Morrison government has also introduced a range of technical amendments and clarifications which will improve the workability of the code whilst retaining its overall effect. So these changes include streamlining the requirements for digital platforms to give advance notice of algorithm changes to make them more workable, clarifying the arbitration criteria so that it considers the reasonable costs of both the digital platform and news media businesses, and also clarifying the role of the ACCC, ensuring its focus is on providing factual information to assist the arbitrator and adjusting the effect of anti-avoidance provisions so that they take effect from the commencement of the code and ensuring the government's policy intent of not interfering with existing contractual rights under the code uh, is achieved. To ensure the code is working as the government intends, the code will be reviewed by Treasury within one year of its commencement. I mentioned the conduct of Facebook in recent days, and I've already made some statements on the record about this, but I want to reiterate my disappointment and my disgust at how Facebook has blocked Australian news. And in doing so, it has done so much to trash its reputation in this country. It is completely irresponsible for Facebook to have blocked vital health information pages during a pandemic. It is completely irresponsible for Facebook to block the wide range of vital information pages, including pages belonging to the Royal Children's Hospital, MS Australia, a number of Indigenous health services and uh, the Kids Cancer Project. This conduct is an assault on Australians' freedom and it is a gross abuse of power. And we contrast this appalling behaviour uh, with the behaviour of Google, which has operated in good faith to reach the deals that I referenced earlier. And as I say, we expect that more deals will follow. And I think that as a result of uh, the good conduct of Google, um, its reputation will be further enhanced in this country. And make no bones about it, the conduct of Facebook has ricocheted around the globe. It has ricocheted around the globe. Many other citizens in many other countries are appalled at what has happened here in this country. We will not be bullied. We will not be intimidated. The Morrison government has consistently said that we want to see Facebook and Google remain operating and viable and thriving in Australia, but we also expect them to comply with the laws passed by our democratically elected parliament of Australia. And I am pleased to report that there has been some very good progress uh, in some other countries, such as Canada, and some initial reports that have just come out in the last day or so uh, have indicated that Canada is poised to support uh, the very landmark and, and world-leading example of the Morrison government and make companies like Facebook pay for news content generated by Canadian publishers. The Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Gilbul, 
strongly condemned Facebook's moves, and uh, he is quoted as saying, and I just quote him now, I think what Facebook is doing in Australia is highly irresponsible and compromises the safety of many Australian people. And what Facebook did was highly irresponsible. It did compromise safety. I received an email from a person, I won't identify this person, who said that he was most distressed because a friend had posted about her very traumatic uh, experiences being the victim of a crime, and she had spent a number of years doing so on her Facebook page, including posting a number of very relevant news media articles uh, concerning the trauma that she had suffered. And these articles have now been removed. Uh, her plight and her position, her decision to fight for what she believed in has been undermined uh, because of Facebook's conduct. And I really hope that we do see other countries around the world taking the lead of the Morrison government and taking a stand against these global giants. And I will say something to Facebook. Um, if Mark, if you're listening, I worked for a news corporation in New York uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, at a time when news corporation acquired MySpace, and MySpace was going to be the big new global platform, and uh, there were great aspirations for its future. But within a number of years, that particular platform uh, gradually died away. And if Facebook in this country becomes a place where people can no longer trust on the information it publishes, if it becomes a place where credible news can no longer be found, where credible journalism can no longer be found, then Facebook's role in our democracy is diminished. Not only is this an issue of its reputation, this is an issue of its relevance. And I say to Mark and all of his other executive team all around the world, as they count their billions of dollars, including billions of dollars of advertising revenue, I say to them, just have a look at the demise of some other platforms when they do the wrong thing by the people they serve. Facebook is only as good as the people who use it. And if they lose the trust and confidence of those who use Facebook, then Facebook may well one day see a similar demise. So this code is healthy for our democracy. It preserves jobs in newsrooms, in media organisations around this country, from the small country towns to our big cities. And it gives great confidence for those young men and women who want to forge a life in journalism, who want to forge a life working in media, including, of course, in traditional print or broadcasting. We understand that public interest journalism often requires lengthy, complex and cost-intensive investigations. And these laws will ensure that journalists and publishers are rightly rewarded for their work rather than are being ripped off by the platforms as has been occurring. And of course, I'm also very pleased to make mention of the fact that the bill involves substantial penalties for breaching the code's main provision. Uh, and these penalty provisions will be enforced by the ACCC. So it is good to see uh, across this chamber a universal support for this bill. I acknowledge that there are some proposed amendments, but it is wonderful to see across this chamber from the Labor Party and the Greens and the crossbench a strong backing of this landmark legislation. As I say, I really hope and trust that our bill and our aspirations for our Australian media companies are picked up by other countries around this world and adopted, which can only be a very 
good thing for our democracy. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. In uh, September 1993, Rupert Murdoch gave a speech from London that was broadcast via satellite uh, to analysts uh, and investors at various locations around the world. In the speech, he announced for the first time that his business would expand to the internet, offering, he said, endless data and information, even electronic newspapers, to anyone in the world with the necessary equipment to receive it. He said, technology is racing ahead so rapidly. News and entertainment sources are proliferating at such a rate that the media mogul has been replaced. The consumer is in the saddle, driving the telecommunications industry. The technology is galloping over the old regulatory machinery. And so the parliament finds itself today debating how the regulatory machinery can catch up. And it's no small irony that Mr Murdoch, still the media mogul, has championed this bill. The next year brought the first mention of the internet in this chamber. In August 1994, Senator John Tierney reported, I've recently returned from a study tour to the United States where I looked at the information superhighway. Remember that term? Its implications for Australian industry and society and its implications for the parliament in terms of the regulatory framework that we establish and modify to assist the development of this new stage of the Industrial Revolution. From the very beginning, it was widely understood that the internet would have a profound effect on our society. And over the decades, speeches given to this chamber have charted the internet's development. First mention of Google in Hansard in June 2001. YouTube, October 2006. First mention of Facebook in Hansard, April 2008 and the first mention of Twitter in Hansard, May 2009. There is no record that I could find of a mention of MySpace. The optimism of the early 1990s has given way to a certain grimmer reality, deep concerns about the privacy of consumers, concerns about the power of internet companies and concerns about the democratic principles at stake, particularly after the 2016 uh, election in the United States. Those concerns relate to specific forms of power that the large tech companies have acquired through a cycle of accumulation described as surveillance capitalism. The capacity to collect large amounts of data, the ability to process that data through sophisticated algorithms, building a profile of users that can predict what they will do, and selling advertising based upon this information. Importantly, the cycle of accumulation leads the tech giants to accumulate ever greater amounts of data and engage in ever intensifying behaviour modification. This power has created immense wealth for the, for the global tech giants. Rarely did these companies, nor senators in this chamber, preempt the dark implications of this new power. Rarer still were the attempts to substantially regulate them. And so the power of these platforms has grown mostly unchallenged particularly as platforms begin to take on the role of a fundamental public service. That power was nakedly on display last week when Facebook denied access to Australian news sites to millions of their Australian users. Not only were Facebook's actions a disgraceful response to a matter of public debate, it was indeed a risk to public safety, including blocking resources for domestic violence victims the Bureau of Meteorology potentially during an emergency, and indeed government health advice during the global pandemic. The University of Canberra's 2020 Digital News report found that during the COVID-19 outbreak, 49 per cent of respondents used Facebook as their only source of news about the coronavirus, a vital public service that informs millions of Australians about a de deadly pandemic was held ransom to the political will of a large multinational company. As I speak in this chamber, Facebook continues to block Australian citizens from consuming news on their platform. It is an extraordinary situation. And so we do debate this bill with the eyes of the world upon the chamber. Labor will indeed support this legislation. Uh, we have some reservations about some aspects of the legislation that will uh, indeed be the subject of amendments uh, I imagine tomorrow morning. Uh, and there has been some debate in the community about the bill and whether or not it prefers the interests of one set of global uh, media giants over another. 
Uh, and I just say to this place, this should not be the last time uh, we consider these issues. Uh, we've got to look past the interests of global media giants and see the interests of ordinary people, uh, citizens of the country. Uh, and we've got to be determined uh, and watch carefully, I think, developments, particularly in the United States, where the last Congress uh, and the new Biden administration appear to be developing an approach to antitrust legislation that we should consider carefully uh, our approach and our response as those global developments occur. It does remain to be seen whether the government's code is workable or how big a difference it will make. The code's exposed a large number of Australian businesses to uncertainty. It doesn't guarantee any particular outcomes for media organisations, journalists, citizens or consumers. It's not clear how the money raised will be directed towards public interest journalism, in particular regional journalism, where 150 titles have closed uh, over the life of this government for investigative journalism that um, is referred to in the last contribution and for newswire services such as AAP. It is indeed heavily weighted to the large media interests. Australia has one of the most heavily concentrated media markets in the world. And the bill does very little to contribute to enhancing our media diversity. It doesn't deal with the parlous state of employment in journalism and it's unclear how the code would affect future funding arrangements for the ABC and SBS. It's not clear that the code is the most efficient or effective way of directing resources from the tech giants to support journalism. And it is indeed only one of the ACCC's recommendations to support public interest journalism. Other recommendations include genuine media reform, stable and adequate funding for public broadcasters, adequate direct funding and tax incentives and philanthropy measures. The Morrison government is yet to explain what is going on and what this means for Australians. But it is indeed a start. It is a first step uh, for this place uh, and for Australia uh, in dealing with regulation uh, for this very important uh, sector of our economy. Uh, I'd look forward to seeing a focus, uh, indeed, listening to some of the other contributions uh, on the tax paid by some of these global uh, giants uh, and proper effective regulation. And I suspect that some of the answer lies in what this parliament does, some of the answer lies in what legislatures do overseas, and some of it must lie in global, co uh, global cooperation in the public interest and in the interest of citizens to make sure that we don't see abuses of market power uh, and the misuse of the power of information uh, around the world. Google has now signed deals with 50 Australian publishers, Seven West, Guardian Australia, Nine, Australian Community Media, Schwartz Media, Junkie, amongst others. And the world-leading nature of this legislation does rekindle Australia's role as a social laboratory. In the early 20th century, Australian reforms led the world in social reform, minimum wage, unemployment benefits, old age pensions. There were democratic experiments as well, the secret ballot, mandatory voting, women's suffrage. At the same time, Australia should be a place where technology companies, well, where, where we develop novel approaches to regulation for technology countries. Australians are early adopters uh, of these technologies, rarely discon disconnected from their phones. Uh, enthusiastic users of smartphone technology, we should be paying attention uh, to these issues here. That's made Australia a place where there are soft launches of apps and features. It was Australia, um, I'm less than pleased to report, where we first uh, had access to the wonderful features of Pokemon Go, which was a big uh, feature of my kids' lives, uh, did mean that I could observed them playing Pokemon Go in all sorts of places all over Sydney. It did mean, despite the fact that they were very connected to their telephones, it did mean they got a bit of exercise and out in the sun a little bit more than they otherwise, they otherwise might. I am reliably informed that, that Senator Dunningham can be found at various locations around Tasmania, you know, clocking in or whatever it is that you do on Pokemon Go. That's it. 
it makes sense that uh, that Australia is a place. Do they have branches in Tasmania? It, it, good. It, it makes sense that Australia is a place where that work can be done. Many countries will be watching our progress. Australia must be vigilant about the digital threats to our democracy, both from overseas uh, and from, in particular, extremist organisations here. In his 1993 speech, Mr Murdoch claimed, advances in the technology of, te of telecommunications have proved an unambiguous threat to totalitarian regimes everywhere. History hasn't been kind to Mr Murdoch's optimism. And I think his optimism it wasn't only he who was optimistic about that. I think many of us, as we were observing the growth of the internet uh, and social media, thought it would be a useful adjunct to enrich our democracy. The spread of social media hasn't been followed by a wave of democratic sentiment across the world. It's fomented a distrust in elected government, wild conspiracy theories, uh, reactionary political movements, including fascism. The fault is not solely with the tech platforms. Uh, some of the media companies have been engaging in exactly that kind of behaviour as well. Um, the, I have to say that some of the material that Sky News circulated uh, on their platform that is then reinforced across Facebook, posting figures like Lauren Southern and Steve Bannon and wild conspiracy theories about the American election, enthusiastically posted uh, by some of the people uh, who sit on the other side of that chamber, I'm pleased to say, not represented there this evening, but some of the characters in the LNP uh, circulate that material as well. And of course, that kind of sensationalism, that kind of appeal to a sort of reactionary base element, is a result of a deliberate strategy to ride the algorithms of social media. It encourages users to seek out media that they already agree with. The feedback loop creates a radicalising effect. There are consequences for this deliberate attempt to ride off the spread of conspiracy theories. Late last year, Sky News Australia shared videos across its digital platforms that cast doubt on the result of the American election. Here, there are some still on their YouTube page. One that says Pennsylvanian postal worker who claims US vote was rigged denied he recanted allegations—1.1 million views. Another story, there is something odd about postal votes which magic magically materialised for Biden. An editorial from Alan Jones, 760,000 views. US Postal Service worker alleges potential photo fraud, according to Project Veritas, nearly 900,000 views. Something stinks to high heaven in the US presidential election from former Senator Bernardi, nearly 800,000 views. The false belief the deliberately propagated, deliberately misrepresented, often propagated by interests hostile to the interests of the United States, was directed deliberately towards the insurrection at the US Capitol, which was a direct attempt to over overturn the will of, of millions of American voters. Five people died, 140 were injured. It could indeed have been much worse in terms of casualties or its impact on American doc democracy. We can't afford to ignore that the most significant threats to democracy always come from inside. Democracy in America, Alistair Tocqueville wrote, the species of oppression by which democratic nations are menaced is unlike anything that ever before existed in the world. Our contemporaries will find no prototype in their memories. The spiralling mix of algorithm and politics is an oppression that has not existed yet in the world, it divides our society in new and complex ways. It undermines our ability to have a shared view of facts and reality, and it radicalises people and movements purely for profit. Responding to it will require leadership, long-term leadership, proactive attempts to regulate our public sphere, and it will require accountability from our media for the views that they publish. The code is a start, but there is indeed much more work to do. 
Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I also rise to make a contribution to the debate about the Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020. As other senators have done so far in this debate, before I turn to the bill itself, I wanted to make some observations about the events of the last week. As I've said many times before, as somebody who believes in private property rights, I accept the fact that a social media company who wants to run their platform without any news on it has every right to do so. However, their users and everyone else is entitled to make judgments about them if they do so. In their desire to avoid the implications of the news media bargain code, Facebook has removed news from their platform and delivered a significantly diminished service to their users as a result. As we've heard throughout this debate, many Australians do turn to Facebook for their news and current affairs, and they are now not able to do so. Inevitably, Facebook will become a less attractive platform for them as a result. In my capacity as chair of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security, I am also concerned about the implications of this decision for the spread of misinformation and disinformation. The spread of misinformation, and in particular state-sponsored disinformation, is of great concern. It contributes to many of the problems that the PJCIS will be examining this year, including foreign interference in our democracy and increasing extremism and online radicalism. And they are also apparent in debates about the safety of vaccines. Some examples of this mis misinformation appears to be, at face value, at least trivial, like a recent viral post purporting to explain that the real reason why we celebrate Australia Day on 26 January is not in fact because of Captain Arthur Phillip and the first fleet landing on that day in 1788, but in fact the passage of a Citizenship Act in uh, 1949. I, I'm no doubt many senators received the emails I did and saw the Facebook post that that originated from. But there is a much darker side to this too. One very troubling recent example of an apparently state-sponsored disinformation campaign was exposed in the Daily Telegraph by Ellen Wynette. She wrote about the experience of a young researcher, Vicky Shu, who courageously has exposed the shocking mistreatment of the Uyghur people by the Chinese Communist Party, both in her capacity previously as a journalist and then as a researcher at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. For her troubles, she was targeted by a transparent attempt to discredit and intimidate her in the form of a social media video which smeared her reputation. Regrettably, Western social media companies, including Facebook, YouTube and Twitter, were all vectors for this disinformation. Some of those platforms took far too long to address it, or they only did so after receiving a media inquiry about it. Now, there have been proposals for quite heavy-handed government-led solutions to these problems that I fear could easily end in a form of state censorship. As a supporter of free speech, that is the last thing that I want to see happen. I would much rather see social media platforms take their own initiatives to combat these problems, as Facebook has been at pains to assure this parliament and other legislatures around the world that they are doing. But one of the best tools that we have to combat false information is to make it easy for truthful information from trusted sources to be more easily shared. With their decision to ban news in Australia, Facebook has perhaps inadvertently, perhaps unintentionally, made that task much harder. I believe, contrary to some of the things we hear in this chamber and elsewhere in public debate about the Australian people, that by and large, actually, most Australians are pretty savvy about the information that they consume. Polling shows that Australians place different levels of trust in different media channels, such as television, radio, print and online. And they even differentiate in their level of trust in individual news outlets or news brands within those categories. But if they lose one of their main avenues to access that information, inevitably the overall quality of the information they can access about events and the world will decline, and particularly 
as what is replaced in their news feeds will not just be photos of friends and family and amusing cat videos, but also the sort of wild and lurid posts that can unfortunately go viral on these platforms. In a climate where confidence in vaccine safety and efficacy is so important to Australians returning to a normal life, this is not just an academic concern. We will all pay an enormous cost if access to factual, evidence-based information about COVID-19 vaccines, for example, is replaced by false information which needlessly undermines Australians' trust in them. In that light, it is particularly unfortunate that in seeking to remove the ability of Australians to share news on their platform, Facebook also apparently inadvertently took down a range of official sources of health information along with charities and others who are really quite distantly removed from the provision of news. Facebook may have unwittingly contributed to a problem I believe they are genuine in tackling, and I urge them to carefully consider the implications of their decision. Throughout this debate, I've met with and heard from both the media and tech companies, and I understand the different perspectives they bring to it. I also participated in the Senate Select Committee on Public Interest Journalism in 2017 and 2018, which first grappled with many of these issues. It was a classic Sam Dastyari, Nick Xenophon uh, trip down memory lane. I think Senator Sarah Hanson Young participated in it also. But it was launched for very good reasons and in recognition of the important role that public interest journalism plays in our liberal democracy. Of course, our democracy is not just the act of voting at a polling booth every few years, but it's the complex and fragile and interrelated institutions that help hold us as democratically elected leaders to account. Uh, in addition, of course, to the role that parliaments, independent courts and civil society plays, journalism is an indispensable uh, and vital role uh, in that process. Uh, it's completely understandable why media organisations, academics, uh, Australians more generally are concerned about the loss of revenue that media organisations have suffered from the transition to a digital online world uh, and the impact that that has had on the public interest journalism that they provide. It's clearly made it much more difficult financially, economically, to provide the support for public interest journalism in the digital world. Uh, print newspaper outlets in particular have lost that effective monopoly that they once had on classified advertising, which for decades uh, cross-subsidised the important public interest journalism that they undertook. I suspect that in years gone by, people who chose to advertise their house or their car through a print newspaper didn't realise or even really care about the fact that they were bankrolling public interest journalism, investigative journalism, but that is the effect of what they did. And the migration of that advertising to online sources has had a massively disruptive effect on our media industry. Uh, tech companies, uh, admittedly, have found what is often a much more efficient and effective way for advertisers to reach those audiences. They can do so much more directly, often more cheaply, uh, but in doing so they are bypassing news media companies. And in recognition of the important work that news media companies did, were able to do because of that cross-subsidisation, uh, we have all been grappling with how do we ensure that they are sustainably funded going forward. There were other ideas uh, to solve this problem canvassed during that Senate inquiry. Uh, it included tax deductibility for donations towards public interest journalism, uh, tax deductible subscriptions for uh, news media organisations, more public funding and even a direct tax on tech platforms. Uh, I admit during the inquiry process I was quite attracted to the idea of allowing tax deductible donations for philanthropic contributions towards investigative journalism. Uh, in recognition of the fact that we allow tax deductible donations toward adv advocacy on matters like environmental issues, social justice issues, refugee issues, well, general welfare issues, um, why would it not be the case that uh, other things of public value, including investigative journalism, could be funded by generous philanthropists through tax deductible donations? And I note there are, in fact, many philanthropists who operate in this space in Australia and overseas who do put their own money behind uh, these efforts in a very commendable way. And I thought that uh, providing them with a tax deduction to facilitate and encourage that was one possible part of the solution to this problem. But I also accept uh, that none of the solutions canvassed by that Senate inquiry were perfect because 
this is a difficult problem to solve uh, due to the very nature of journalism in a democracy. And that's probably why uh, none of the ideas proposed by that committee were taken up uh, by the parliament. For very good reasons, we are all uh, appropriately wary of direct government intervention in the form of funding or regulation of media outlets. Uh, by its very nature, if we want journalists to hold governments to account, uh, we want politicians as far as possible from decisions about how they are funded. Uh, history and, indeed, sadly, much of the world today contain salutary lessons about why that is the case. Uh, inevitably, uh, with these other options canvassed, politicians would have had a hand in deciding both which media outlets would have been qualified for funding and the basis on which they did so. And all of the problems that would have entailed for their independence um, is fairly obvious. A virtue of this code is the fact that the parties have been encouraged, and some are indeed undertaking commercial negotiations outside the code, in the hope that the code never needs to be invoked, let alone the arbitration provisions of the code, which have been very controversial, I note, through the Senate inquiry and public debate. Um, it is a welcome thing that Google, for instance, uh, appears to have reached an agree agreeable commercial terms with as many as 50 media outlets without the code being invoked. I, I think it would be fair to say that most members and senators, and, and certainly myself, have a very strong preference for these issues to be resolved commercially with the least involvement possible from the government. I also appreciate that tech platforms, and particularly Facebook and Google, contribute enormous value to media companies in the form of the significant referral traffic that they send their way. Um, that's perhaps why no media company has ever elected to remove themselves from those platforms, despite their concern that tech companies were uh, freely profiting from their efforts. Um, in this respect, I particularly welcome the inclusion of the two-way value exchange in the code. Uh, in my view, this is a significant improvement by the government on the original draft code proposed by the ACCC, and it was, in my view, an oversight of the ACCC not to recognise that two-way value exchange uh, inherent in these relationships between tech companies and media organisations. Um, it, it's appropriate that we recognise, of course, while there is value for tech platforms in hosting news on their sites. We all go to these sites to look for news. Uh, there's also value uh, for the media companies in being linked to by, their, by these platforms. I think it's also sensible that the digital platforms have been permitted to publish standard offers in recognition of the fact that smaller media organisations are clearly not equipped to engage in complex legal negotiations with large multinationals. And I also welcome the fact that there is a one-year review by Treasury of the effectiveness of the operation of the scheme. Uh, even with our best intentions in this place, we should always be wary of the potential for unintended consequences in the laws that we pass. And in concluding our remarks, I turn to uh, the report of the Senate Economics Committee into this legislation, capably chaired, as always, by my friend Senator Slade Brockman, which had an important uh, contribution to make on this issue of further reviews and consultation. Uh, and it notes, uh, even supporters of the bill felt that further amendments were possible to improve the law. Uh, Free TV recommended a series of amendments, as did SBS, the ABC, the MEAA and Solstice Media, amongst others. Treasury acknowledged that, despite the many and varied consultations and legal advice, that, as is commonly the case for all legislation, quote, there are legal risks associated to the bill, both domestic and international. Treasury also noted that the government, in developing the bill, had considered its domestic and international law obligations. The committee accepts that there remains the possibility that not all the risks have been taken into account and that refer further refinement may be needed to the arbitration mechanism and other parts of the code so that they work in an optimum manner. Accordingly, the committee strongly supports the 12-month review mechanism built into the legislation, and I too strongly support a robust and independent review of the effectiveness of this, opera of this uh, code and its operation uh, to ensure that there are no unintended consequences, that there are no inadvertent effects, to ensure that it is achieving the government's policy objectives, uh, and to ensure that Australia does, make, does remain a very attractive place for uh, innovation, for tech companies to invest uh, and to base themselves here, uh, because if we are to be a prosperous 21st century co country, then we want to ensure that uh, we are an attractive, safe uh, and rival place for them to invest and that they are not discouraged by excessive or burdensome regulation. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
It seems a fair proposal, a code to ensure that news media businesses are fairly remunerated for the content they, they generate, helping to sustain public interest journalism in Australia. But like so much with this government, the difference between what is talked about and the reality of the impact it has on people and businesses is vast. It's that vast gap between reality and delivery that's the hallmark of so much of what this government does. Like many Australians, I woke up on Thursday, the 18th of February, and started flicking through my Facebook newsfeed, and it quickly became apparent that there wasn't a lot of news in my feed. It wasn't just the mainstream news organisations whose posts were missing. It became apparent that many, many organisations were no longer visible. The Australian Bureau of Meteorology, which uses its Facebook page to deliver climate updates and severe weather warnings, was blocked. So too were fire and emergency service pages, state health departments, where daily coronavirus figures and information about potential exposure sites are listed. They were deleted, as was the official page for the governments of the Australian Capital Territory, South Australia and Tasmania. Homelessness services, crisis centres, legal services, all blocked. First Nations organisations in the arts, health, media and community sectors all found their news feeds had been blanked. Thankfully, a lot of these pages have been reinstated. But the pages of many First Nations media organisations are still blank and are likely to remain so, caught up in the crossfire of what's become pun intended, a face-off between the government and a multinational tech giant. Organisations such as NITV, the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, Karma, Bama Bipra, Ngata Media, 3KND, the National Indigenous Times and the peak body First Nations Media Australia and so many others have all had their social media voices silenced. Ironically, First Nations media organisations are in many ways the very definition of public interest journalism. They tell our stories in our way, keep our language and culture strong and alive, reflect us out to the wider community as well as to ourselves. Back when I started as a cadet with the ABC, way back when, there were so very few First Nations people on television and on radio. Stories about First Nations issues, people and communities were usually negative and didn't receive a lot of prominence, certainly not on a national level. And while this is changing, largely due to the work of the trailblazing First Nations media workers and organisations, it's not just the big headline stories and issues that are important. Our community-based media organisations tell the stories that mean so much at the grassroots level. I don't know how many of you have ever watched ICTV, for example, Indigenous Community Television. ICTV is an independent, not-for-profit First Nations media company based in Alice Springs. Most of its content is contributed voluntarily by production companies, organisations and individuals who are in remote communities or providing services to remote communities. Over 50 per cent of their content is in an Indigenous Australian language and more than 50 language groups are represented. ICTV's television service broadcasts for 18 hours per day, seven days per week on channel 601 VAST across remote Australia and on free-to-air digital services on Channel 41 in Alice Springs, Broome and Roeburn. Their core purpose is to improve the lives of First Nations people, especially those living in remote areas, by providing media distribution outlets that enable the active sharing of stories, culture and language. They also produce some of their own content such as the wonderful Bedtime series, which presents stories for children in language using traditional storytelling techniques together with animation, music and film. 
If you aren't fortunate enough to have, set, to have a set-top box or live in one of the free-to-air regions of ICTV, you can catch their programming on ICTV Play online. And I certainly urge you, Senators, to jump on and enjoy some of the content produced in some of our very remote communities. And while you're online, jump on to Indigitube, a project of First Nations Media Australia that is an amazing resource of audio and visual content from around the country, including documentaries, music, animation, podcasts and much more. Just these two services will give you a taste of the rich variety of stories that glimpse into the lives of First Nations people around the country. These services fortunately still have their social presence, but they will be impacted by this media code. It could bring them benefit if this government does its job properly by making available funding that will support their work and the work of other organisations in the First Nations media sector. Senator McCarthy, you will be in continuance. Thank you. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. You know, many had hoped that 2021 would see Mr Albanese and the Labor Party adopt a much more mature approach to industrial relations. But I'm afraid that, upon reflection, we have had no such luck. As with Labor's policies at the last election, we must remember their big taxing policy has not yet been abandoned, their latest effort at industrial relations policy appears to be nothing more than a thought bubble um, or some sort of cater to their base because not only is it economically flawed, but it has so little reflection upon its economic impact, its financial consequences or indeed the need for proper detail for it to be regarded as anything more than um, a, a momentary fantasy. So let's take a closer look at what Labor is proposing for the Australian industrial relations landscape. The first thing we can reflect upon is Labor's plan to cut the pay of casual workers. Now, while there's some people who don't want to be casual workers, there's a lot of people who very much do. They value their 25 per cent loading and the freedom that comes with it. On the ABC's Insiders program just two weeks ago, ACTU Secretary Sally McManus confirmed that casual workers would face a massive upfront pay cut under Labor's industrial relations policies. She told the ABC that casual workers would lose their 25 per cent casual loading compulsorily under the Labor policy to provide sick annual and long service leave a plan that, on average, netting off all of those things, would cost casual workers $153 a week or $7,953 a year. No small change to Australian families. I can tell you, Mr Acting Deputy President, that policy would be devastating for the 486,000 casual workers in my home state of Queensland. Next, we've got Labor's $20 billion, not million, Mr. Acting Deputy President, but billion dollar job tax. Mr. Albanese's sweeping commitment to give Australians in what he calls insecure work new leave types, including all 2.3 million casual workers and 1.2 million independent contractors, access to portable sick leave, annual leave and long service leave, represents an enormous financial hit for which he has no plan to pay. Now, if a casual worker wants permanency, we're more than happy to facilitate that. But to inflict it without any kind of worker choice, to force it upon people without giving them the control of their financial future is, quite frankly, draconian. This would represent a massive financial hit on businesses, which will drive up the cost of employment with the obvious consequence of killing jobs. If you want to stop job creation, this is the fast track to do it. And it would increase the costs of day-to-day -day goods and services at a time when so many Australians can least afford it. Indeed, the Attorney-General's Department 
has estimated that this could cost business up to $20.3 billion per year. No small sum. At a time when Australian employers and employees are recovering from the biggest economic hit since World War II in the after effects of COVID, Labor wants to hit them once more with a new $20 billion tax. Imagine how much damage this new tax would do to Queensland's 600,000 small business small business owners, family business owners, and the 221,000 jobs that have returned in Queensland over the past seven months with the assistance of the support of the federal government. They're already having to deal with the difficulty that comes from operating under state labour. We still in Queensland have to cope with the second worst unemployment rate in the country due to the inertia of state labour. It's worse even than Victoria, which spent most of 2020 in lockdown. That's nothing to be proud of, Ms Palaszczuk. But federal labour's new $20 billion tax would only make the situation so much worse. If that wasn't bad enough, then we have Labor's plan for the Australian Building and Construction Commission. So taking note from the Mr Shorten playbook, Mr Albanese let the cat out of the bag in his recent, recent speech, highlighting his plan for what he said, quote, the abolition of the discredited and politicised Registered Organisations Commission and the Australian Building and Construction Commission, close quote. Now, we don't accept that on face value, of course, but these are the organisations which hold lawless unions, and they are thugs of the first degree, like the CFMMEU, to account. The abolition of the ABCC would be absolutely devastating for Queensland, where we've seen union officials like David Hanna convicted for destroying literally tons of documents, and Michael Ravbar and James Fissenden convicted of unlawful coercion. It's a fancy name for bullying, if ever I've heard it. With officials like these, it should be no surprise that trade union membership has slumped to a historic low of 14 per cent, down from 40 per cent in just 1992. It seems like only a moment ago. But the ABCC does more than just hold lawless unions to account. Since its restoration in December 2016, it's recovered more than $2.6 million in underpaid wages and entitlements and that's benefited more than 4,000 employees. It's collected over $11 million in penalties that have been awarded in the cases that it's brought. It's been successful in nearly 90 per cent of the cases it's brought. Not by any measure the discredited organisation Mr Albanese would have you believe it is. So let's move on to the next part of Labor's plan. Or should we call it a lack of a plan for a fair test for determining who is a casual worker pursuant to the Fair Work Act? Now, they might have used that term, fair test, but we actually have no detail at all from Labor about what this test should be, what the definition should look like. We just have the sort of vague generalities we've come to expect. The fact is, it's Labor's failure to insert a definition into the Fair Work Act for the term casual worker that has created years of confusion for both employers and employees. It's left us with the unreasonable position adopted by the federal court in the decision of Workpack Proprietary Limited and Skeen, which permitted double dipping by those who take the benefit of casual loading on one hand and then the value of permanent entitlements on the other. After two years as leader, you might think Mr Albanese would tell Australians what his definition of a casual worker might be. But still we have crickets. Mr Burke has confirmed that Labor won't be providing a definition anytime soon. Of course, they've, they've said on the record they won't be providing a definition until they form government. So let's cut through it. The Labor Party's industrial relations policy is to slash the wages of casuals, to put a $20 billion tax on business, 
to bring back union lawlessness with the abolition of the ABCC and to not tell us what their definition of a fair test for casuals will look like until after they've been elected. Let's compare and contrast. The Morrison government, on the other hand, is providing Australians with well-reasoned, strong but also fair industrial relations reform. They're not radical, they're not driven by ideology, but they represent a fair and balanced response to problems that all sides of the debate agree must be fixed in order to give employees the confidence to go out into the market and employers the confidence to invest. Now that could be delayed or even blocked as a consequence of those opposite, and that's exactly what Mr Albanese has signalled he will do. But when he stands in the way of these reforms, he stands in the way of a fairer deal for all Australian workers. He stands in the way of opportunity for those who currently sit in the unemployment queue. He's standing the way, in the way of the criminalisation of wage theft, and he's standing in the way of protection for Australia's most vulnerable workers. Order. Senator, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, earlier this month, we passed a sombre anniversary for the tourism sector. The 1st of February marked the beginning of the travel bans, which threw our tourism industry into crisis. As one of the first industries to feel the hit of COVID-19, tourism will also likely be one of the last to recover. Over the past year, I've spoken to hundreds of business owners on teleconferences, Zooms, in person, and in regions like far north Queensland and Tasmania. Every single one of them have expressed to me challenges that they are facing. The importance of government support and their desire to get back to business as usual and keep doing the jobs they love. But the other message that has come through loud and clear is the need for certainty. And I know you're very much aware of this, Mr. President. The foundation of tourism businesses and uh, future bookings and forward planning, whether you're a tour operator running on the Great Barrier Reef, a travel agent in Perth, or accommodation provider in Sydney CBD, certainty is critical, which is why the issue around JobKeeper is such a blow to, the, to, uh, to this sector. The government have known that they were going to end JobKeeper for months. So why is it only in the last two weeks that the Minister Tian met with operators to talk about what they needed most from JobKeeper and what they needed post JobKeeper. The government talks about the challenges facing the industry, offering their sympathy and understanding. As I know you're fully aware, Mr. President, but these businesses don't want government sympathy. They're in the, these circumstances as a direct result uh, of government decisions and deserve a government response. JobKeeper ends in just 34 days. For the government to claim that they are waiting on data or engaging with the sector on what they need at this late, at this late stage is completely unacceptable. We know the sector is in trouble. We know that jobs have been lost. We know uh, internationally facing businesses like tour operators, wholesalers and travel agents will find it difficult until international travel is possible again. And we know that the sector can't afford to wait for, uh, to, for the government's announcement schedule. Pre-COVID, this industry employed over 1 million people across 300,000 businesses. These jobs are at risk and decisions about their future are being decided right now, not at the end of the month. And knowing what an absolute mess the government have made of previous support packages, like the one put forward for travel agents, which is producing vastly inequitable outcomes, it's vital that there is uh, time to properly implement these programs. Mr President, if you can pass this on to your colleagues, I strongly urge the government to be upfront and provide certainty to the industry about what support will be available post JobKeeper. If you can do that, Mr President, uh, 
while we wait for this, I beg your pardon. I said you're relying on the president. Well, yes, yes. He's sitting up there. He's listening when he's not playing with his uh, mobile phone. And I know he'll pass on <coughs> to the government that while we wait for this certainty, to all those employed in this sector, I want you to know that I and my Labor colleagues will continue to fight for you and for the future of this important industry. We stand with you every step of the way. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Serving the people of Queensland and Australia, tonight I will review the National Water Reform Productivity Commission draft report dated February 2021, a periodic review of the operation of the National Water Initiative. Put simply, this report is a celebration of profit over people. So let's go through the many failings of this report. Failing one, the National Water Initiative has resulted in water being taken from family farms that were producing food and fibre for the world. Instead, large corporate agriculture purchased that water. The result has been a huge reduction in the number of family farms growing varied crops that support a wide range of local services and local communities. Commercial agriculture, also known as monoculture, uses large acreage devoted to crops like almonds, grapes or oranges. These, prop these properties are highly mechanised, reducing local employment to just a handful. Compared with family farms, corporate agriculture puts a fraction of the wealth back into local communities. The profits from corporate agriculture are moved to capital cities and then to overseas tax havens. There's nothing in corporate agriculture for everyday Australians and their communities. The Productivity Commission celebrates this increased profit even though it comes at a massive cost to employment and the health of regional Australia. Failing number two, corporate agriculture uses its ability to run at a loss during the growth phase to purchase water for whatever price it takes. That's forcing family farms out of the water market and ultimately off the land. This water is then moved downstream through natural constraints like the Barma Choke in search of cheaper land. Water has to be stuffed through these constraints to meet irrigation requests downstream. The environmental devastation in the Barma Choke, the Goulburn River and elsewhere in the Connected Basin is not included in the Productivity Commission's calculations. Yet protecting the national estate matters. The extra profits accruing to the big end of town must be balanced against the environmental damage that the creation of these profits cause. Money might be all that matters to the Productivity Commission. One Nation suggests it goes back and factors environmental damage into its calculations now, not at some point in the future. These natural constraints can't wait for the next review in 10 years, as suggested on page 13, table 2. By then, the damage will be irreparable. Failing number three, the Productivity Commission <coughs> excuse me, failed to quantify the risk to Australia's economy <coughs> excuse me, from shifting agricultural production from diversified family farms to monoculture. For example, one negative movement in the price for almonds or for oranges or for table grapes, and that has happened before, will decimate billions of dollars of agricultural production. <coughs> the Productivity Commission might not understand risk one Nation does. Before the National Water Initiative corrupted the water market, Australian agriculture was resilient and diversified. Not now. So failing number four, the report praises water trading as transparent. <laughs> Yet this government tried to introduce a transparent water scheme register in 2012 and it failed. Following this sole attempt, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority simply gave up. We do not have a National Water Register. Water trading is a feeding ground for ruthless water traders and speculators. If it considers, if the Productivity Commission considers this, this system to be transparent, the Productivity Commission must be using X-ray glasses. It's not transparent, it's broken. Shortly the Senate will be asked to vote on a bill to create the Office of the Inspector General for Compliance. A key responsibility of this office will be to investigate water trading. Since its inception in 2007, the Water Act provided for a water register on which to record these trades. No such water register has ever been created. The Liberal National Government continues breaking its own laws. How does the Inspector General inspect water trading if there's no register of water trades? It doesn't and it can't. 
A complete, transparent, basin-wide water register is 14 years overdue and should be started immediately. Failing number five, water licences, once taken from family farms through unequal economic power, are then being traded into different valleys. The Productivity Commission report applauds this. There's no analysis in the report of the effect on the land of this changed distribution of agricultural production. Corporate agriculture is buying up marginal farmland cheaply. Then miraculously, it's brought to life with water transferred from traditional agricultural areas. This is not for cropping purposes where the land can rest. These new areas are being devoted to permanent plantings that require continuous watering and continuous runoff. The result is massive salination and environmental damage. This is a time bomb with a short fuse. Just a few years of this irresponsible agriculture due to unrestrained water trading and the issue, issue of salination will be back in the headlines. At that time, we'll ask, how did this happen? Well, it happened because we listened to the Productivity Commission. We valued corporate profits and so-called market efficiency over careful custodianship of the land. Custodianship that family farms practiced for almost 200 years successfully. Failing number six, custodianship of the land goes back much further than just 200 years and the Productivity Commission has, quote, provided some views on Aboriginal submissions for consideration by the committee. Meaningless, nothing words is all the Productivity Commission has to offer because Aboriginal use of water can only be quantified by volume, not by utility. Soon after my return to the Senate, in 2019, I flew over the whole Murray-Darling Basin and then toured the whole basin, including the Northern Basin, which is northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. In Wilcannia, I spoke with Aboriginal community leaders Waddy and Eddie Harris. And I thank Eddie and Waddy for explaining that their people are a river tribe. At the heart of their culture is their connection to the river, the Darling River. Kids used to spend the day in the river entertaining themselves in a healthy and constructive way. Sometimes there were fish or yabbies for dinner. Elders used to take the young ones and sit in the river and tell dreamtime stories to encourage respect for themselves and their culture. When mismanagement drains the river, these things are not possible. River tribes can't move downstream chasing the water. They need water where they are, where they are there. Now, Wilcannia has the same problem many country towns have. Their town weirs are insufficient. Well, Kenya's weir is in the wrong spot and frequently suffers blue-green algae blooms. The New South Wales government has been promising a new weir for 30 years and still construction has not started. What a metaphor that is for the way in which the nationals have abandoned their so-called country constituency. That's why One Nation's, One, One Nation's Weirs for Life program will build new weirs in country areas to increase water storage for human needs. One Nation listens to and engages with rural Australians, with family farms. I ask our rural supporters listening to this speech, when was the last time you saw someone from the Productivity Commission on your farms asking you about how agriculture really works? In summary, the Productivity Commission report into water policy does not consider the damage to rural communities, does not consider environmental damage in a meaningful and responsive way does not consider the risk to Australia's economy, economy and exports to have billions of dollars of production tied to monoculture, does not consider employment loss from monoculture, does not consider the final mile of financial transactions, where the money winds up and who pays tax on the income, does not consider that water trading accountability must have a transparent, accurate water register, does not consider custodianship of the land in particular salination from corporate agriculture's permanent plantings in areas that are not suitable for permanent plantings. And finally, does not consider or factor in the dislocation of Aboriginal river tribes for whom water is the centre of their culture. There's been way too many deaths audits from bureaucrats in the big cities falsely declaring the Murray-Darling Basin plan is working just fine. Audits that cannot quantify environmental damage damage to rural communities and deprivation of Aboriginal cultural use of water. These things are ignored and the glowing report card issued falsely. Meanwhile, the Nationals, the self-proclaimed party of the bush, is busy chasing city votes and saying yes, sir, to the Liberals. 
Rural Australia can't take this. Rural Australia is out of gutful. If the final report does not widen its calculations to include the fullness of the issues, one nation will move to reject the report. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.